Hi guys, today I want to share my insights into the mysterious handbag looking carvings on one of the Gobal Tepe pillars. Gobal Tepe is a groundbreaking archaeological site which changed the paradigm of our thoughts on the Neolithic age. Its oval structures with magnificent megalithic pillars revealed a much more sophisticated Stone Age culture beyond our previous assumptions. Besides their impressive sizes, many of the limestone pillars have decorative carvings with animal reliefs. The most controversial and well-known pillar is Pillar 43, a surrounding pillar in Enclosure D. The three handbag objects on top of this pillar have caught a lot of attention for decades. What were they and what function did they serve? Since this pillar has an obvious vulture, it's also called the vulture stone. The handbags and the vulture have been widely discussed and speculated on. Certain researchers propose that the vulture stone depicts the younger Dry's comet impact. Some think the bags contain crop seeds to replenish the earth after the flood. Some claim that a circle near the vulture was a human head, because there is a headless human body down below. In this video, I'll offer different ideas on the handbag-like patterns and the vulture. My new concept correlates with the latest excavation results at Gobal Tepe and recent findings on numerous other Neolithic structures in the Near East region. Spoiler alert, these so-called handbags might not be bags at all. This particular Pillar 43 is like a big puzzle. It's graphically complex with various elements floating around on three sides of the pillar. In addition to the vulture and the so-called handbags, there are birds, a circle, a scorpion, snakes, a headless man, a big cat, and more. The lower portion is damaged, so the carvings are incomplete. Without seeing the full picture, it will be even more difficult to presume the entire story these reliefs were meant to convey. Fortunately, there is important background information of Gobaki Tepe that can help us to narrow down the possibilities. In my last video, I presented some of the most significant archaeological new findings on this site, which overturned many previous beliefs. Archaeologists dug several keyhole trenches down to the site's bedrock. They discovered that Gobaki Tepe was a permanent settlement with domesticated houses, human burials, cisterns and channels to collect rainwater, and hearths to make fire. The site contains countless stone points, grinding tools, and stone vessels to process and cook food. Gobel Tepe was not a mere ritual center visited on special occasions, but a populated town. It might not be deliberately buried either, but possibly inundated by sediments and erosion over time during the thousands of years in the pre-pottery Neolithic era. Other than these excavation results, the similarities between Gobal Tepe animal artifacts and the modern time hunting and exploration clubs also attributed to my proposal. The psychological motive behind the animal carvings with fangs of Gobal Tepe and the fanged big animals in a 20th century explorers club might be the same. Both groups of hunters were proud of their extraordinary achievements involving subduing big game animals, and therefore showcase them in their communal halls. Consequently, I propose that at Gopak Tepe, the large pillars of the oval enclosures, the ones adorned by mostly animal reliefs, might be commemorations to document, memorialize, and honor major hunting trips, game accomplishments, hero hunters, and or hunting gods. Perhaps each pillar was dedicated to a successful hunting event, like a storyboard, which recorded the animals they saw and were captured. Occasionally, scenes were included. These round enclosures were more plausible to correspond to the hunters who lived there, instead of having celestial or astronomy meanings. Ancient hunters may have celebrated and shared great hunting stories and legends in their oval hall of fame. Using such a scenario, we can explain almost all the pillar reliefs but Pillar 43 is an exception due to its bizarre bag carvings. They seem unrelated to hunting. What do they? Before explaining my thought processes on the alleged handbags, I want to quickly explain my interpretation of the big vulture 
which gives the pillar the name of the vulture stone. This vulture is well depicted with wings spreading out, almost touching a sphere or circle. Remember the conjecture claiming that this sphere is the head of the headless man at the bottom. I disagree. There have been many artifacts of human heads and masks found at the Gopalka Tepe, and they all have prominent noses and brow bones. On another relief piece, archaeologists suggested that this shape might be a picture of a human head, which is probable, judging by the typical emphasized nose and brow bones. While、well, on pillar forty-three, the circle by the vulture is a real circle that's unlikely a human head. A sphere hanging in the air during the Neolithic time. What can that be? The sun or the moon, right? I say it ought to be the sun in conjunction with the posed vulture nearby, because sunbathing in early mornings is a signature habit of vultures. It's called a heraldic pose. In the early mornings, vultures often will sit with their wings spread wide, increasing the surface area of their bodies, so that the sun can warm them. Dry their feathers, big off the bacteria and parasites. So I think this part of the pillar is presenting the vulture with its wings open by the rising sun, a fairly grand scene admired by the Neolithic people as well as observers today. What are symbolic or ritualistic meanings behind this depiction? Maybe, but if that's the case, we would have seen similar repeated carvings on site. Though the vulture with open wings and the sun is a unique picture based on current findings, therefore, it's more likely that the stonemasons who created a vulture and the sun reliefs intended to record a scene they deemed interesting and noteworthy of permanent documentation. That same logic contradicts the various theories that the handbag-looking carvings were ritualistic or symbolic. Wherein symbolic items should have been represented in a repetitious motif, and not singular like on one pillar. According to excavation analysis, scientists think that the grains processed, cooked, and fermented at the Gobak Tepe were wild grains. This challenges the suspicion that handbags contained crop seeds. If there were advanced beings who somehow came here to offer domesticated crop seeds in handbags. Then there should be evidence of such grains, especially considering that Gobak Tepe prospered for over two thousand years. During this long period, there would have been plenty of time to utilize and spread domesticated seeds if they existed, which there is no evidence of. As a result, the seed bag idea is not convincing. The intriguing bag relief might, in fact, speak for something entirely different. Let's take a closer look. On top of pillar forty-three, apart from the woven kind of pattern, three handbags were each accompanied by a small zoomorphic carving. The red bag has an upside-down quadruped animal. The left one has a figure that looks like a bent ostrich with the bird's head facing downwards. The middle handbag is accompanied by a big cat-like animal falling off the slope. One could argue this animal is a standing quadruped, perhaps a gazelle or a goat. With long horns facing the handle of the bag, that's probably not accurate. From the diverse on-site animal portraits, we can see that the thicknesses of an animal's limbs are all depicted similarly, which are truthful illustrations. If the animal at the middle bag was standing or charging at the bag handle, then that would make his hind legs much thicker than the front ones, which is not the artistic custom of Gobek Tepe masons. Hence, I think this figure was meant as an animal facing down with a long tail over its back. Now, the three animals associated with the three bags are all facing down, as if falling over something. That's very interesting to me and worth pondering. In what situation would that happen? Animal pit traps come to mind. Animal traps are rarely discussed a topic in the Stone Age archaeology. Usually, we assume that hunter-gatherers just chased animals and hunted them with stone points. This is a gross underestimation of these ancient people, who are far more advanced. Think about it. Compared to many animals, humans have rather constrained physical abilities. We are not as strong or fast, 
We like fangs and claws. So, how did Stone Age humans compete with megafauna during the Pleistocene? Not only competed with megafauna, but became the top species over all the other predators on the planet. A 2021 paper reconstructed the nutrition of Stone Age humans, and found that humans were apex predators for two million years. The conclusion was based on the acidity of the human stomach, the structure of the fat cells in our bodies. An average genome, which jointly indicate that humans ate mostly meat during the exceedingly long Stone Age. For example, the acidity of our stomach is high when compared to omnivores and even to other predators. This study does not exclude the fact that humans also ate starch-rich food as early as a hundred thousand years ago, though the majority of human food source was meat. These researchers postulate that only the extinction of larger animals in various parts of the world and the decline of animal numbers towards the end of the Stone Age led humans to gradually increase the grain and vegetable elements in their nutrition, until finally they had no choice but to domesticate both plants and animals and became farmers. Back to the question of how did early humans become the apex predators? Ancient hunters didn't achieve this status by merely throwing stone spears and arrows, even though that's what most illustrations present. There are other crucial factors that have been overlooked. Humans' physical powers cannot rival other predators. Plus, close-range hunting is a very dangerous job, even for lions and wolves. Humans' exceptional advantage came from our brain. Which provides a superior cognitive capability. Neolithic, possibly Paleolithic hunters had better and more effective hunting methods that helped avoid the injuries and maximize the outcomes by using traps. Unlike active hunting, which requires a human presence during the kill, trapping can capture animals at any time, especially when humans are gone. In 2019. Anthropologists found two human-built pits in Mexico, which were dug at least 15,000 years ago and used to trap mammoths. They contained the remains of 14 woolly mammoths. From Middle East, Levant, North Africa, Central Asia, and Arabia, over 6,000 mega hunting traps constructed at different times over the last 10,000 years have been identified. Multiple such traps are not far from Gobelac Tepe and other testapular Neolithic sites, like this one is at the south of Karahan Tepe. Although Gobelac Tepe is older, timing-wise, these huge traps might well overlap with these long-lived Stonehill towns. From the ground, these extensive traps consist of low stone walls, which look obscure. They were first discovered from the air during the 1920s and named desert kites by aviators because they look like old-fashioned children's kites with streamers. Regardless of form, old kites in the region have driving lines of low stone walls that converge to funnel animals towards a trap, such as a pit or precipice. These hunting traps are considered some of the largest ancient structures of their era. The constructions of these kites are carefully designed to cross herding animals' regular paths and stretching over large land masses. The entrances and the ends of the kites often lie where a slope breaks or changes to deceive the animals. These gigantic structures suggest that hunter-gatherers in these regions were much more sophisticated than had been initially thought. According to archaeologists. Even the earliest builders of these kites knew that high walls were not necessary. They were aware that shorter walls will be enough to control the flow of animals into the enclosed area, because migrating animals like antelopes and gazelles were prone to avoid unusual structures like rows of stones and shallow ditches. These early hunters, therefore, laid obstacle walls to compel the animals into the traps, without scaring them off. These walls are hundreds of meters to five kilometers or three miles long, ending with pits, which are usually lined with stone up to four meters or thirteen feet deep. A kite can have one to more than twenty such pits to trap animals. Some kites have multiple pits side by side at the enclosure. 
The pits were covered with lattice work or other materials that's not noticeable on the ground. Once animal herds were directed into these kites and walked on these traps, they would fall and be captured. In this way, many animals can be caught in one shot. Here are some photos of excavated pit traps. The shapes of these pits look quite familiar, don't they? They resemble handbags, wouldn't you agree? Let's compare them with the bag-like reliefs on Pillar 43 of Gobalak Tepe. They do share common features. Moreover, I suggest that the woven patterns directly above and below the bags might represent the lattice covers of the pits. Is it possible that the so-called handbags were actually Neolithic pit traps to hunt animals? I want to remind you of the three animals carved next to the bag objects are all facing down like they are falling off cliffs. In fact, the right and middle ones have their heads touching the ground. These figures might be demonstrating various kinds of animals falling into hunting traps. In all likelihood, these hunters would have used the same concept to set up snake traps and baited traps for predatory animals. I suspect another pillar carving at Gobalak Tepe, the one with multiple birds, is indicative of bird traps with nets. On another note, the overwhelming number of the desert kites spanning in these regions point to the abundance of animals back then, which enabled mass hunting. These traps must have been very successful hunting methods, where the ancients wouldn't have built so many of them and continued to use the same technique for thousands of years. With these massive traps, the hunters would have captured plenty of game animals for food, hides, and likely extras for trading, which means the hunter-gatherer groups would need to settle down somewhere not too far from their traps in order to process and store a great amount of meat products. Meat would have been dried, cured, and stored for leaner winter seasons. By the way, cured meat, such as prosciutto, sausage, and salami, are still widely popular today. These settlements could be either seasonal or year-round. Furthermore, if a group of people invested significant effort and time to build vast hunting traps, then they must have long-term plans with them and wouldn't abandon them lightly or quickly. The game achievements from these mega traps might be able to support bigger, settled hunter-gatherer communities, and the bigger community would have more helping hands with the construction maintenance and upkeep of these mega traps. So long and so forth, the community would have grown continuously and reached to the height of a large, permanent hunter-gathering town. Could that be the origin of Gobalak Tepe? So, my proposition on the Gobalak Tepe handbag carving on top of Pillar 43 is that these figures, along with the three downward-facing animals, may be indications of hunting traps. Stone Age humans became the apex predators, not only because of their stone points, but also their strategic and clever trap settings. They were good at assessing situations, learning patterns, lining up strategies, and finding solutions. I expect nothing less from them. After all, their brain-to-body ratio was higher than ours. Trapping is considerably more efficient and much safer than stock hunting with stone points. And in the right seasons and settings, trapping was probably highly reliable and easier. With bountiful animal meat products and wild grains, Neolithic people built permanent settlements at Gobak Tepe and other Testapular Stone Hill sites. These traps were able to keep the captured animals alive for a while, which might eventually lead to animal domestication in the Near East. It's possible that these desert kites facilitated the founding of these enigmatic sites and were a crucial innovation in human history and development. What do you think? If you have any insights, please leave me a comment. If you like my video, please subscribe to my channel and share with others. You can also support me on Patreon, which is a monthly charge, or on Buy Me a Coffee. I appreciate your support. This is Curious Being. I'm Tina. Thanks for watching and see you next time.